Hi, welcome to the next of our series of mini lectures. Today is going to be a very short one. I'm going to give you the basic physics background to understand optical trapping. Now, optical trapping is a complex phenomena. To treat it rigorously in mathematics is far beyond the scope of what we want to do in this class. This class really isn't about that, and would take a graduate level class to understand it completely, I think. And even then, you might not get a really good view of the uh, entire field of optical trapping. Uh, but we can understand optical trapping through a very, very simple picture that's uh, intuitive if you remember your freshman physics course, and that's what we want to do. So let's go over some review material. We start off, and since I have red, let me choose a different color. Let's try a green today. We start off with a ray of light, and we know uh, a ray of light corresponding to the path of a photon has a wave vector k naught. Um, and of course, in some coordinate frame, if it's going at an angle, uh, let's call it theta, we can break it down into a kx component. And since this is a simple triangle thing, uh, we know that, that ky is equal to k naught sine theta, and kz in this case is equal to k naught cosine theta. This is simple trigonometry, this should be pretty straightforward. We know that the value of k naught, the wave vector, is just 2 pi over the wavelength of the light. So we can calculate that. And we also know that in a fully three-dimensional system, uh, the square of k naught has to be the sum of the square of all of the components. Uh, this is just a length of a vector thing that you covered in fields or your, your uh, vector class. OK, let's go over a little bit of basic physics now to remind you of that. Uh, first of all, we're going to draw some stuff from from modern physics, where we remember that in the quantum mechanical realm, when we're talking about photons or individual particles of light, the momentum is just h bar, which is Planck's constant h divided by 2 pi, uh, times the wave vector in a particular direction. Uh, so this allows us, once we know the wavelength, to calculate k and to convert to a momentum value. The other thing we're going to need to remember from physics is the basic Newton equations, which is force is mass times acceleration. The momentum is the mass times the velocity. And since the time derivative of acceleration is velocity, um, or excuse me, the time derivative of velocity is acceleration, then the force is just the change in momentum as a function of time. There's one other thing you really do need to remember, and this is very critical. This is one of the foundations of the universe, a law you will not ever escape, and that is this, that in any system, momentum is conserved. Momentum is conserved in any system. That's extremely important. So let's look at some examples of this really quickly. If I have lambda naught is equal to 600 nanometers, And I go ahead and I calculate my k naught. I take my k naught and I plug it to get a momentum value. I'm going to find that my momentum along the direction k naught is traveling is approximately equal to 10 to the minus 27 Newton meters. And that's a pretty small value. One photon does not carry a lot of momentum. But remember, in a laser beam or an intense light source, there are a lot of photons uh, in any given second because intensity is watts per unit area and watts is just joules per second, which you can then calculate number of photons per second in knowing that uh, the energy of one photon is Planck's constant times the frequency. Uh, let's go ahead and look at the momentum conservation thing again real quickly. And let me grab another color here. Let's say we have a system. And our system consists of one ball that is initially moving with momentum in that direction. Let's call this the x direction. And we have another ball. Let's get a different ink color here. Let's use blue. That this ball is going to hit. And this momentum has, or this ball has zero momentum. It's just sitting there. And we know that what's going to happen is this ball is going to come along. The black ball is going to come along, and it's going to hit the blue ball. And if you've ever played pool, you get a pretty good sense of what's going to happen. And I'm going to do an idealized case that after the collision in our system, what we've got 
is that the black ball is now moving in this direction and we want to know what direction the blue ball is moving into. Well, our system consists of both balls. We know the total momentum for that system is just that. That's the only thing in the system that has any momentum and it's in that direction. At the end of our, of our collision, let's put another box around our system, um, we know that the black ball is moving in that direction, that's some information that we're given, and we want to know the direction of the blue ball. Well, we know that we have to have a component this way to cancel out the momentum of the black ball because there's no momentum going in the vertical or y direction here. And so if it's moving this way afterwards, we have to have a component to cancel it out. And our total momentum still has to sum up to a component in this direction. So we're going to have also a component in that direction. So our blue ball is going to move that way. And this is just a real quick example of how to apply conservation of momentum to know that after the collision, the total amount of momentum has to stay the same in a closed system. And we'll use that in our in-class exercise when we, we calculate some of the optical trapping things. Great. So we've reviewed basic physics. Uh, maybe we've brought you back to your uncomfortable and awkward freshman year and a physics class. Uh, what does this have to do with optical trapping? The point is that, and let's circle this again, photons have momentum given by this equation here. That momentum depends on the wavelength. In a beam, the overall momentum depends on the wavelength and the number of photons that are in the beam. Uh, we know that momentum is conserved, and we know if the photons change direction, they have to impart momentum to the thing that changes it. So let's go down to the next page and look at, in a very, very zoomed-in scale, and let me change the ink color here, something that shows up a little bit better on black, uh, a system. Here we have a small sphere we want to trap, and here we have a microscope objective with lots of rays of light, and we know the light's essentially going pretty much from the left to the right, and we want to know what's the momentum of all the photons of this beam of light as an ensemble average, the average direction. Well, some photons have a vertical momentum, some have a downward momentum, but essentially this is going to cancel out because the beam's symmetrical, and the overall momentum of this system is going to be in that direction, and we're going to say the overall momentum of the ball is zero. It's just sitting there. So what happens if we move our beam of light over toward our little sphere, our ball? Um, well, because the sphere is transparent, it bends the light, and this is a simulation of what happens when you bring a beam of light into a sphere. And now let's look at the momentum of the system. Uh, before, the momentum we had was in this direction, but now we've obviously got a component in this direction that's not quite as big, and the light's also, on average, going downward, giving an overall momentum, k naught, and this value is k naught because the momentum, of course, has to be, be, be somewhat conserved. But in order to cancel this out, in order to make sure that things work out properly, the ball has to have a momentum in the vertical direction, so that the overall momentum is in the correct direction coming in. And so our system essentially is this right here, if we refer back to the other drawing. So notice that as the sphere enters the beam, it's sucked into the beam more vertically. Let's take a look in an example of see how the sphere would get in there. Let's take a look and see what happens if the sphere is over to one end of the beam, as shown in this picture. Well, now essentially what we have is the momentum of the photons is more in that direction because we have less vertical and horizontal component. That means in order for the momentum to cancel out, the sphere gets sucked into the focus that way. And we're going to do an exercise in class where you do some actual force calculations on this and look at this in a little bit more detail. But this is a brief overview of how the optical trapping process occurs in a very simplified picture through a simple transfer of momentums of the photons into a small transparent object.